Chairman, dear Board of Directors, first of all, I would like to thank for the nice invitation which was given to me by the Board of Directors to come here and to give you this talk, what is the need of the surgeon in primary prostate cancer. And as uh, Dr. Zollikofer stated out, I think we are on the way with prostate cancer to have a new era we have new facilities, we have new tools, and it is very important that we keep contact together and that we share our decision-making process, which will be the best treatment for the patient. And as urologists, we need the oncologist, we need the radio-oncologist, we need also the nuclear medicine, we need radiology with all the facilities which are possible. And I will just show you what I think should be necessary and what we would like to have as an information from your side. So let me just start with some basics. Prostate cancer is the most common prostate cancer and one out of six men will be diagnosed in his life with prostate cancer. One out of 12 will be suffering and he needs treatment. And one out of 25 will die from prostate cancer. What does it mean for Switzerland? Prostate cancer is the most common cancer and the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in Swiss men, as you can see. We have around 6,000 new cases per year and we have 1,300 deaths due to prostate cancer in Switzerland, which is in accordance with the most uh, civilized or industrialized countries. What are the main objectives of a therapy nowadays? We have to seek to reduct, to reduce overtreatment. We need a reduction of side effects and we want to have a maximum cancer control. And I think these objectives can only be obtained with an interdisciplinary team, which I was just mentioning before. So what are the therapeutic options nowadays? And you see all the options which are possible nowadays. I have to change to the green one, sorry. So this is active surveillance, brachytherapy, radical prostatectomy, external beam therapy, and which is coming now with a tremendous speed and which gives a broad discussion in the future will be the focal therapy. Whatever you will use as energy, but focal therapy has the great potential to change the therapeutic options and the therapeutic pathway. What are the main areas of interest of a urologist regarding imaging in prostate cancer? I think we have four main objectives. One is the diagnosis, the staging, the treatment plan, and the surveillance. And we have different possibilities to achieve information so that we can share this information all together and find the right way to treat these patients. So the disease localization should be done prior to biopsy, maybe prior to repeat biopsy if a patient is under active surveillance. And of course, we need the disease localization prior to radical or I would say nowadays focal therapy. We have to put together a strategy and a treatment plan. We have to stratificate the risk of the patient. Which patient really does need treatment? And we need our colleagues from the radiology for the guiding therapy, for the treatment of recurrence, and most of all in surveillance. I just want to show you the algorithm which was true up to the year 2000. So patients came mostly with elevated PSA. Not a lot of them had symptoms. They were sent to truss biopsy. Maybe they had a bone scintigraphy as a staging procedure and then they underwent therapy. And, uh, you know, all these patients which were treated, and I show you just the surgical treatment, uh, here on, on two studies, 
they need a long time to show that they have a benefit from the operation, which is known by the ERSPC study and also by the PIVO trial. And you see, patients have to survive more than 10 years to have a benefit of a surgical therapy. What has changed to the algorithm, maybe in the year 2014, the PSA is certainly still the leading cause of, of, uh, of diagnosis. But imaging has become much more important, and the primary imaging is getting more and more uh, standard. So we want to have patients without any prior biopsy, not to have any, any interference in the imaging process. And then the question is whether we have an image-guided biopsy, or whether we would go to a truss biopsy, or maybe we would then define the staging and the treatment plan by the imaging, which gives us different possibilities. And one of the possibilities is also to have the patient without any treatment at the moment in an active surveillance program, which is very or quite severe, and we need in this program a surveillance imaging process. The limitations of a truss biopsy is just shown here. So normally we do a 12-core biopsy with, within that random, uh, and you see it is somewhat a uh, possibility to really hit the tumor. But on the other hand, it is even more possible that you will not hit the tumor. So this is the great place where we want to have information from your side, which gives us the opportunity to have lesions which are suspicious. And these lesions, they can be biopsied. And we can even make a targeted biopsy, which gives us more information. And just to show you what I mean is I just will switch to this slide. So this is normally a truss biopsy with 12 cords. And you might get an information about the patient with one positive biopsy, which gives you just a Gleason score, three plus three, six. And if you have the options and you do perineal template biopsy nowadays, you will get much more information and maybe this patient will not have a Gleason score 6 tumor, but the Gleason score 9 tumor, which completely changes the planning of his treatment. And I think this is a very important information. This is a new issue, how we have to, uh, to plan and to approach prostate cancer in the future. What we also expect from your side is to know a little bit where do you see the tumor and you know there was a recommendation from a consensus meeting to have 10 posterior glandular regions and 6 anterior glandular regions. I don't know whether everybody is using that system, so it seems to be not very common at the moment. But nevertheless, we need and we urge to know where you see a lesion in the prostate so that we can proceed with a template biopsy in that area to get the maximum of information. Of course, staging PS in, in prostate cancer is, is important. We want to know about the local situation. We want to know about lymph nodes, and we want to know about possible metastases. These three goals are still present, and they should be fulfilled. We want to know, is this a tumor which is invading the seminal vesicles? Is it a PT3B lesion or is it really a, a localized lesion so that we can uh, plan and we can approach this tumor in a different way? Why is it so important to know about the situation? You see here, very well in this study from Suardi, which was recently published, that if you have an organ-confined lesion or an almost organ-confined lesion, the chance to be cured is much more higher than if you have a PT3B lesion 
which means that the, pro the, the tumor is invading the seminal vesicle. What's about positive lymph nodes? And how shall we proceed with these lymph nodes? Have they to be retrieved surgically before we have to, uh, to, to go on with our decision-making process? Which location has to be looked at? Is it only the pelvic region? Is it the retroperitoneal lesion? Do we have also to look at the mediastinal lesions? So I just show you what we per perform to know more about lymph nodes if they are suspicious or if patients do have a high PSA. So we do a, a so-called extended lymph node dissection, which is part of the surgery in many, many cases. How is it so important? We would like to know whether these, pa these patients have to get an, in, in, uh, an adjuvant treatment with a hormonal treatment. Why? Because those patients getting a hormonal treatment, they have a much better prognosis and a much, much better survival if they get immediate treatment. So it is necessary to recognize, to identify those patients of, on, the, on the risk, to have lymph node metastases, to start an immediate treatment after surgery as soon as possible. So this will be more the talk of Mrs. Gillison afterwards, but systemic therapy for systemic disease. Uh, of course, we all know about these pictures sometimes, even in primary diagnosis for the patient. So far, one of the main information was also to know about the extension of the tumor to be able to perform so-called neurovascular protection or the protection of the neurovascular bundle, which was uh, described for the first time by Patrick Walsh in this publication. And you know there are a lot of fascias around the prostate, and what we should urge for is not to go too close to the prostate. The closer you go to the prostate, the better the potency will be afterwards. But if you stay just on the prostatic capsule, you may will have, you will have maybe the best results regarding potency, but you will have a high risk of recurrence, as you see here with the so-called interfascial nerve sparing. So these informations are important. Nerve sparing, on which side shall we do the nerve sparing? Shall we use frozen section analysis as we do nowadays, which is quite difficult. We have some time to wait to have the result, and the result never is is absolutely uh, finally. We should know where is the tumor, how is the tumor in his extension. In case of anterior tumors, we would like to know this very precisely because if we do surgery, we should try to have enough tissue around the tumor, around the prostate, to avoid positive surgical margins, because positive surgical margins, as you see here, are one of the most or the strongest predictors of recurrence, PSA recurrence, and also for the overall survival of these patients. Da Vinci prostatectomy helps us to perform radical prostatectomies, to perform maybe a better preservation of the neurovascular bundle. But we need the information, where is the tumor located? Where do we have some risk? And are we allowed to perform uh, such a procedure on this patient? So. One of the possibilities is to have the diffusion coefficient. And you all know about that the lower the, co the coefficient is, the higher the grade of the Gleason score is, and we know that the higher Gleason score cancers, and you see it here very well, 8 to 10, they are the tumors who will kill the patient in every decade of the patient. So we really want to know, is this an aggressive tumor? And not only by the biopsy, but nowadays we have the opportunity and we are very happy to have this possibility to share this information with you. 
Active surveillance, I already mentioned, is very important for low-grade tumors, and it prevents patients to undergo therapies with side effects. And in these situations, we need a good radiologist who gives us the perfect information, who gives us information regarding coefficient, and so that we can go on with the active surveillance in these cases, or we have to stop the process. And it was Mrs. Richard which published that paper. I think we can perfectly rely on the information if you do the MRI scoring and you see that you only have uh, less than 5% upgrade in those patients who have a scoring between 1 and 2 out of 5. So I come to the conclusion. What are the surgeon's needs regarding radiologists? We want to know where the tumor is. We would like to know how big he is. Does it penetrate the capsule? Does it penetrate the neurovascular bundle? Are there signs of lymph node metastasis? Is it really a local or a systemic disease? Or is it a local or a systemic recurrence? Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention.